for our first event, uh, we have someone who I've met personally, and he's a fantastic guy. This Franco-American is the first gay and from Biddeford speaker of the main house of representatives. But not only that, he's also the youngest speaker in the country. For the past years, he's introduced legislation to con ban conversion therapy, have the largest affordable housing investment in the state's history, and provide funding for vocational schools for the first time since 1998. I present to you, Mr. Ryan Fecto. Well, good morning, everyone. Can you, can you all hear me? Yes. 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 <laughs> okay, great. Excellent. Well, first and foremost, thank you. I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for the invitation to keynote the Young Franco-American Summit today. Um, I only wish I could be with all of you in person, I'm currently in Philadelphia to celebrate the marriage of a good friend and college roommate. Otherwise, I certainly would have made uh, today a priority to be with all of you. I want to thank Daniel for the invitation to be here and to all of you in the University of Maine system for the work you are undertaking to preserve, celebrate, and add to our shared cultural identity as Franco-Americans. Uh, my stories, uh, my family's story is similar to many Franco families in Maine. In 1964, a little later than most French Canadians, my meme Pepe and my dad moved from a rural town in Quebec to Biddeford. They moved to work in the textile mills. While Biddeford was founded many decades prior, you might argue that the city's existence didn't sprout until the first mill brick was laid in the early 1800s. My meme and Pepe never really learned English. They used it as necessary. And as my meme grows older, she relies, it, relies on it far less. Uh, the English words at her disposal are more or less ones of utility, not for sport. My dad speaks French at home as my meme now lives with him and English outside of the house. Perhaps a victim of my parents' divorce, I never spoke French, although I have, like my meme, the utility of picking out words in conversation. And of course, I know all too well, whenever food is being discussed, uh, I am certainly one who's weak for my meme's cooking, especially her own spin on the beloved French Canadian dessert sugar pie. While my parents' divorce might explain part of why I'm not a French speaker, the real crux of the matter is the long-standing discrimination and forced assimilation of immigrant families, including Franco-Americans. As a country, we never assessed bilingualism as a treasure, at least not in communications with immigrant families. Instead, families like my own felt the pressure to keep the French language from the next generation. After all, they believed success could not be realized for their kids and grandkids unless they acted and sounded more like those of English descendants. It is incredibly tragic uh, and, and very similar to how native languages of the Passamaquoddy and Penobscot tribes were discouraged by elders to protect young children from discrimination and to give them an easier time getting on at school. French seeking adults sadly encouraged English as a way of protecting their children as well. And in my area, there was also the outright discrimination. As many of you probably know, the KKK had a chapter in Saco. Historical accounts suggest that the KKK planned to march into Biddeford to harass and perhaps commit violence against immigrants, particularly the Irish and Francos who shared Catholicism, which was an affront to the KKK. I'll note the in the urban areas of Maine, ethnic tensions and and nativist hatreds rose through the 1920s. And in 1924, the Ku Klux Klan claimed 50,000 members here in our great state. The Klan never made it from Saco into Biddeford. Instead, they were met on the bridge between the cities with bricks and whatever else could be thrown at them. The folklore around this, the, this event uh, coined the term Battle of the Bridge which is how high school football games between Saco and Biddeford have since been marqueed over the years. I must admit that it hasn't been until later in my life that I gained a deeper appreciation for and the recognition of my Franco heritage, perhaps in part 
I never realized how special our traditions, food, and language were. After all, I grew up surrounded by peers whose surnames could have filled a Quebec telephone book. Becoming Speaker of the House has in part put into perspective. I am the only, I'm, I'm only the second Franco speaker in Maine's history. I'm the first to hail from Biddeford, which in and of itself seems crazy at the surface given it is one of the largest cities in the state. But then again, it isn't surprising at all because Biddeford, uh, Biddeford is and was a Franco town with working class families. Surely not the kind of town where a political leader the, or the speaker of the house would originate. I also didn't put it together until recently that the tug between my Franco side of my identity and the English side of my identity was so neatly on display. My Pepe uh, and my Meme owned a duplex in Saco. On the top floor lived my Meme and Pepe. On the first floor, by total happenstance, lived my mom's parents, my, my Grammy and Pepe. My Pepe on my mom's side, who went by the nickname Fudge, is a bit of a long story, but in essence, he was ad adopted and likely uh, it doesn't have Franco roots, even though uh, his family was, of course, Franco, and hence why uh, I called him Pepe as well. I had both sides of the coin right there in that one building. As a child on the weekends, I would go upstairs to a different world with a language I could not speak, but felt in my heart I could. During the weekdays, I would sometimes find myself on the first floor with English, familiar but foreign at the same time. Part of me, but not all of me. Funny enough, my Pepe Fudge would try to speak French to me when I was little, and I would forbid it, saying that only Meme and Pepe upstairs <laughs> were allowed to speak French. Uh, I guess little me was responsible for the forced assimilation of, of Pepe Fudge. I'm sure <laughs> I share all this because I want to I want to round third and bring home a point for today's context. And I, I have to apologize for the, the baseball reference. Uh, MLB playoffs fresh in the mind with the uh, Red Sox and the ALC, ALDS, ALCS. We have the opportunity to help a new generation of French speakers avoid the same fate. We are all recognizing the importance of protecting language and culture and treasuring it. While yes, English will be more important to new Mainers in terms of attaining gainful employment, making friends with neighbors and connecting with others, we must make clear that success for new Mainers does not rely on learning English alone. Success also relies upon the preservation of their language and traditions that are at the heart of who they are. In fact, let's be clear, Knowing how to speak multiple, language, multiple languages is not just a gift, it is a means to climbing the economic ladder. Despite what has been spun for decades, it is not a detriment to one's success because they speak more than one language. It's an assimilation myth spun by those who fear difference and want to retain their grasp on the levers of power. So whenever I have the chance to meet new Mainers, I emphasize the importance of not giving all that they are to be all who we've become. I know if I had the chance to spin back the clock, the one thing I'd want more than anything else is to know how to say in French, thank you for having me. Thank you for celebrating our Franco roots. And let's make sure more young people find this pride in their Franco-ness that, that you all emulate over the course of this day. Merci, thank you for having me. And I'm happy to take questions. I don't know if you wanted to do Q&A, uh, Daniel, but happy to take questions if there, if there are any. So we do um, have questions, a Q&A planned. Um, so if, you're in person, raise your hand. If you're on Zoom, I'll try my best. Actually, if you're on Zoom, you can speak up as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Skip player. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, 
Hi there. Um, so I am a Franco-Michigander, and um, hearing the stories of uh, New England is it's so interesting for me to connect with this community. Um, when you were growing up in Biddeford, uh, did you feel like there was still a, a huge attachment to this Franco-American sentiment? Or was it something that you felt was really more or less within your household, your homestead, and your own family? It's a really good question. I, 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 think, it, I think there was a real attachment. We, in, in Biddeford, we celebrate um, a festival called La Camesse that was, you know, oh, that was, certainly had the um the symbolism of our franconess and the fact that we came together and we had singers and artists from uh, quebec coming to biddeford to perform but I, as a young person while while i recognized that we were celebrating being franco i never really like i said in my in my, in my remarks i never really appreciated it because i think it was so um it was so commonplace I, like you know, I wasn't joking. Like, if you were to look at, you know, my peers in high school and, and look at their surnames, um, I, I, even here on Zoom, I, I'm looking around and I can see some of the same names I would have seen, uh, you know, on the on the class roster. <laughs> and so it was, it was so, it was so there, I guess. But at the same time, uh, I I do feel like there was a lot of. Um, I think there I think there's been a large push to to really change who we are uh, to to be more like everyone else. and i and I see that a lot in Biddeford now. Um, you know the the Franco festival, for example, is not nearly as robust as it was during its heyday. I think if you were to come to Biddeford for La Carmesse in the nineteen nineties, you would see a very different festival than what you see now, which is, Sort of a petering out of attendance and fewer uh, folks who have um, the ability of uh, performing uh, Quebec songs, you know. So like, there's just a, there's just a, um, there's a little bit of a lost art there, and it's uh, I think that's a bit unfortunate. But you know, growing up, it was definitely there. I mean, it was it was present. I mean, it could, it, you you shared this with, with your peers, although we never really talked about it. Like I don't remember ever having. A conversation with someone in school and being like, "You have a meme, I have a pepe." You know, your 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 parents speak French. My parents like that never happened, um, and I, I think that's the story of assimilation. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Hi, um, this is Julia from the Franco American Pathways podcast. Hi. Hi. Uh, we just talked with, talked with Jenna the other day, and I'm looking forward to meeting you in person at some point soon. Um, so we just last night, I was actually at the Osher Mac Library with Emma Boutiet and Libby yes. Bishop. Yes, looking at maps of Biddeford um, and talking about that history, kind of mapping the cultural landscape on top of that geography. Um, throughout the course of time. And it was in preparation for something that we actually did in Lewiston, which is, was a mapping of Franco Lewiston episode. We're doing the same thing for Biddeford. So we'll be meeting at 7.30 a.m. on Tuesday morning at Elements Coffee. Um, you're welcome to join us if you're back in town. That would be great. Um, and I'm wondering if there's some places in Biddeford, I'm sure Emma and Lucy will have some great ideas, but if there's elements of historical Franco Biddeford, um, I know we'll definitely be going to the bridge and going to some, see some of those mill sites, but are there any other places in Biddeford that we shouldn't miss? Mm. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, well, obviously, as you, as you know, uh, so much of our Franco history is also retained at the churches. Um, and some of them have obviously since closed. But if it had several Catholic churches, I think we're officially down to one. Um, and I'm not sure, uh, a couple of them remain vacant. And I would wonder what kind of artifacts still reside there. Um, and Senator Senator Shambo has an amazing French recording of Christmas mass um, mm -hmm. from like the 1970s or 1960s, which is really, really really cool and if you can get your hands on that i i would highly recommend it but i i, I would wonder what kind of franco artifacts do exist or records uh exist at the at the church thank you 
Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll brainstorm some more and pass along some more ideas before Tuesday as well. Thanks. Well, Patrick, uh, thank you for your remarks. Uh, very inspiring. And it's, I mean, just, I think, I don't want to speak for anyone else, but it's a huge honor to have you with us this morning. Um, my question is whether there's still a Franco-American caucus in the legislature and what kind of work it engages in, if, if there is. Yeah, there still is a Franco-American caucus. It primarily is organized for the purposes of, of putting together Franco-American Day at the State House, which we just held uh, about a month ago, uh, uh, which is a bit unusual. We, we usually do it during the course of the legislative session because we turn a, a, a session day into a French speaking program uh, with, uh, with us inducting members into the Hall of Fame, the Franco-American Hall of Fame. Um, but because of the pandemic, everything got totally twisted around. And so we, and then we also were, we were told that the French ambassador to the US was gonna be in Maine. And so we scrambled very quickly to put together the event this year uh, in October, I believe, or September. Um, and it, yeah, sorry, it was in September. Uh, it, and it was really, really, I thought, I actually think it went really well. In fact, in, I, I heard from a lot of folks that felt like even though session day is nice, having an entire day dedicated to the program uh, actually probably is a little bit better. And we had we had to have, to have the families of the inductees and friends and, and previous inductees sitting on the house floor, which I thought was kind of cool, which during a normal session day, we wouldn't be able to do. Um, so that is primarily the, the focus of the Franco-American caucus. Uh, I feel like there's obviously opportunity for it to do more. Um, to this point, it hasn't. And it's another it's another good example of uh, sort of the the petering off of uh, Franco identity because there's fewer members in the caucus than even when I was first elected back in 2014, uh, and and those who are in the caucus are actually uh, not Franco themselves but represent predominantly Franco communities, which is also very interesting. So you know it'd be probably relatively unheard of they would have Lewis and Auburn reps. Who are not Franco in the, in the legislature? Uh, same with Waterville, uh, Biddeford. I am, I am one of three members from Biddeford. I'm the only Franco representative from from Biddeford. So, uh, just to give some perspective, there's a shifting in in who lives in our communities or um, who still has Franco roots or or identity. Perhaps we need to do a better job recruiting candidates who are Franco to the legislature. Thank you. Any other questions on Zoom? In person? No? All right. Well, um, thank you, Mr. Speaker.